So my name is Allison Tierney and I live in Wisconsin and I'm a wife, a mom to two little girls and I am also, which kind of comes into my story a little bit, I'm actually an oncology dietitian um, by professional background. So, you know, we say that my career took a very ironic twist at some point here with my cancer journey. I always, I think that my journey with cancer actually really started well before my own diagnosis. And I say that because my mom is a breast cancer survivor. My, um, my maternal grandmother passed away from lung cancer before I was born. My paternal grandmother is a breast cancer survivor. My godmother is a breast cancer survivor. And my grandfather passed away from liver cancer. So there's a lot of cancer burden in my family. How it actually started is I had just finished my breastfeeding journey with my second child. And just 10 days later from our last feed, I had my annual OBGYN visit. Um, so it was my first visit after having a baby. And we were just kind of talking and my physician did a breast exam, found a lump. And we actually didn't really do much about it because it was 10 days post breastfeeding, right? Could have been a clogged duct or breast changed so much during breastfeeding. So we kind of didn't do anything about it. I remember just kind of shooting the breeze with her and chatting more. And then um, I came home, I told my husband about it. I was like, you know, we did find this lump. I, I want you to feel it so that we can both pay attention to it. I had had a lump in between my pregnancies that was ultrasounded, went away after a cycle. And so I think coming to it, my husband kind of thought like, oh, you already, you've had this before, so no big deal. And I kept feeling the lump at home. And the best way that I can describe it is every time I felt it, I felt anxious. I had like this overwhelming anxiety every time that I would feel it. And so after a little while, I was actually preparing for a conference where I was going to be the main breast cancer nutrition speaker at a lifestyle medicine conference. So I was preparing my research and everything and came across some information about breast cancer after or during pregnancy or even in postpartum during nursing and how it's rare, but that it's possible. And I already knew that, right, as an oncology dietitian, but there was something about seeing that as I was preparing that I was like, you know what, I think I need to get a little peace of mind about this lump that I'm feeling. Um, so I messaged my, uh, my OBGYN and just kind of told her, she was very quick to say, yep, yeah, let's get an ultrasound. She knew my family history very well. And that ultrasound led to uh, a mammogram minutes later and a biopsy just a couple hours later. And um, between the mammogram and the biopsy, the radiologist did tell me, she's like, I feel very confident that I know what I'm looking at. And she's like, I do believe this is going to be breast cancer, but we do need to get a biopsy to confirm ended up getting the biopsy and then like 48 hours later had the confirmed diagnosis of breast cancer. Like every other cancer uh, patient when they're diagnosed, there's so much unknown, right? All I knew is that I had breast cancer. Um, I didn't, you know, I hadn't had an MRI yet. I hadn't met with the surgeon, none of that. So there's so much unknown and I think it's just so overwhelmingly scary. And I do remember when the, the radiologist came into the room initially <laughs> And I could just see on her face, like I could just tell exactly what she was going to tell me. And I started crying and I said, I was like, I've seen so many different scenarios play out from here, right? The scenarios that are like, you know, super successful all the way to stage four and just losing people way too early, right? And so I think all of those things flashed before my eyes and just not knowing where you'll fall in that spectrum, I guess you could say. So initially, the diagnosis from the original biopsy was DCIS with microinvasion. So really meaning that it had contained to the mammary gland with a little bit that had left. Um, however, when I saw my breast surgeon on that Monday, like right after I came back from that conference, I, I don't... I guess I don't know what I expected, but my mom was a 16 year survivor and had a lumpectomy and radiation 16 years ago. And I had thought, I think I thought to myself that maybe my scenario would be the same. I don't know why. Right. And the first thing the, uh, the breast surgeon told me, 
and the other interesting part about it is, is that I was actually treated at the same facility that I, that I worked at. So this breast surgeon was my colleague. She was referring patients to me, you know? And so I had told the, the surgeon, I said, my husband and my mom were there. And I just said, pretend I don't know anything because I don't know everything. Right. But I was like, pretend that I don't know anything about breast cancer or anything. And, you know, just tell me just like you would tell any other patient. She said, well, you're actually going to need a mastectomy. The where the tumor is located is too close to the nipple. We can't save the nipple. We're going to need a mastectomy. And I, my mom describes it as a gut punch. And I was like, I think that was it because I don't think I was prepared to hear mastectomy right away, right? Because my mom's journey, not to say that every, nobody's journey is the same, right? But I think I maybe expected a lumpectomy. I'm not sure. And then, um, and then the other part of it was that my surgeon was concerned that it was not DCIS. She had concerns that it was um, invasive. Um, she didn't use that term at the time. She said, I'm just, you're not presenting as DCIS. So I would like to get another biopsy. So I ended up getting another biopsy and it was a mammogram guided biopsy. The the tech that was working and the nurse that was working that biopsy told me that she's never had that many samples taken in one biopsy before. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what is happening, right? And that biopsy came back as DCIS with microinvasion as well. As you'll know, where the story continues, my ultimate diagnosis was not DCIS with microinvasion. It was invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, and then in between that, trying to figure out, so I already knew that I was supposed to, that I should be getting, or it was recommended that I would get a single mastectomy, but I had already gone through the thought process that I opted to get a double mastectomy. And then in that, in that about week, 10 day span, um, my genetic testing results did come back and they came back positive. And, um, I think I was surprised that it came back positive, even knowing that I had an extensive family history because, I know the percentage, right? And I know how many cancers are related to the genetics and it's actually not that many. So I was just kind of like, wait, really? What? You know? Um, and so the genetic testing was, um, it was a blood test. And from my understanding at the time that I, when I did my genetic testing, they tested for 84 different genes and not all of those genes were like confirmed this increases the risk of breast cancer, other cancers, but many of them they're learning more about and they're kind of essentially tracking, right? So there are some genetic mutations that they know quite a bit about, right? The BRCA1, the BRCA2, the genetic mutation that I carry is called the CHECK2. So I had the blood test and then they go through and check all these different genes. Um, I tested positive only for the check two and not for any of the others. And so then the recommendation was going to be a double mastectomy. And I'm glad that I had already wrapped my mind around having a double mastectomy and that the positive mutation didn't have to I didn't have to rethink and reevaluate. Um, so then from there, I did opt to have a double mastectomy with D-flap reconstruction. So that was the next step. Um, I had to wait eight weeks in order to have that surgery, which is far too long, in my opinion, just because of the anxiety and the emotions that come with it. But I also understand the reasoning why it was so late. You know, you have to have a breast surgeon on the team, a plastic surgeon. It's like literally an all day affair. Um, so then I have that surgery on July 14th in 2022. So preparing for that was overwhelming. And I think it was be multifactorial, right? And I think, you know, you have this cancer in your body and you're waiting eight weeks and eight weeks in the grand scheme of things is not that a much amount of time, right? But at the same time, you're just like, what's happening in my body right now, right? Like, at what point is it? Like, I already knew it was micro invasion. So like, you have all of these wild thoughts running through your mind, right? Um, and at the time, my youngest child was um, 15 months old at diagnosis, right? I still had, and my oldest was um, four and a half. So I had really young kids. And um, for other people that can relate to a similar situation, like you still have to parent you like they still need you in those aspects. So that was a really interesting experience. Because at that time, physically, I felt fine. I felt like me, but mentally, you know, I was scared. Um, I was grieving the fact that I would lose my breasts, of course, you know, and my, my breasts were never to me like that big of a deal. 
leading up to it. I mean, I remember crying all the way to the hospital. I think it was a part of that grieving process and just being scared of like, what's going to come from this. Um, and we knew that going into it, that they were going to be checking the sentinel lymph node or the closest lymph node to the tumor, check to see if it had cancer in it. If it was positive, the breast or the plastic surgeon had already informed me that he would not continue with the reconstruction. You would have to, if it was positive for the lymph node, you'd have to get radiation. And he didn't want to do the reconstruction if radiation was necessary. Um, and so thankfully during that surgery, it came back negative. They went through the rest of the surgery. And so really what it was is a double mastectomy. So the breast surgeon, this is how I was explained to it. Um, the breast surgeon is doing the mastectomy, whereas the plastic surgeon is doing the D flap reconstruction. So the D flap um, for me, the tissue is recreating the breast with your own tissue. Um, so I have a scar from one hip to the other, and there was tissue taken from my abdomen to recreate the breasts. Um, and the reason why that surgery is so intense is because um, it has everything to do with these really tiny blood vessels that they essentially like reconnect to be able to keep the breast tissue, the the new tissue that takes place of the breast alive. Um, so the, the plastic surgeon is starting to do the abdominal work while the breast surgeon is taking is doing the mastectomy. And then once it's confirmed that the lymph node was negative, after the mastectomy is finished, then they go on to start recreating the breast. And so the surgery itself is about eight to 10 hours. Um, and um, so and then you're expected to stay in the hospital three to five nights. I was in the hospital for three nights and was able to go home on that on that third day. And um, it's about a 12-ish week recovery. And when we say that, like even at 12 weeks, your body is definitely, it's such a new thing. Your body, it's such a new body um, and you're still limited in some capacity, but uh, you're able to kind of return back to normal things by about 12 weeks. The recovery was really hard. And I, so... You know, the options for reconstruction were either no reconstruction, implants, or the D-flap. And the implant surgery is tends to be a shorter recovery, not as intense, but then there are further surgeries down the road usually. And the D-flap is kind of known as like a really big intense surgery with a longer recovery, but you might have less surgeries as a result. Um, so I was prepared to have this longer recovery and bigger intense surgery at the time. And I'm really thankful to say that I, I did very well in the recovery. Um, I actually walked to my two-week follow-up appointment um, from my house to the hospital. And it's not super far, but um, my surgeon was like, wait, you did what? And I was like, I feel, I was feeling good. And I have a plan B of like, if I can't walk back, my dad's going to pick me up, you know? Um, so I did have a really good recovery from that standpoint. And honestly, it was really taking it one day at a time. And I did find the first two weeks were the hardest first week, especially. And I think the hardest part about it is because, I mean, your breasts have been removed. You have this huge incisions, huge incision on your, on your abdominal. Um, I couldn't even bathe myself, right? My husband had to shower me and, you know, just taking a shower in itself was a huge event. And you're like, okay, I took a shower. Now I need to rest. Right. So I'd never been in that situation before where, something that is so simple of most everyday life, you know, is very challenging. So what happens during the surgery then is they're going to do a surgical pathology, really looking, okay, kind of like that biopsy, but now they have the breast, they have the tumors, and then they're going to reassess. Um, and that surgical pathology does take some time to come back. And I made the mistake of looking at my my chart uh, pathology results before talking to my doctor. And I think because I just expected like, hey, this is going to be great. Like, you know, my nurse navigator was a really good friend of mine. Um, so I messaged her and said, hey, when am I going to hear back from the surgeon regarding the pathology results? And she's like, you read the report, didn't you? And I said, yes. And she called me immediately because she knew because um, the, the report said invasive ductal. Like, and I knew that invasive ductal meant it was further. And um, and really, the reason why they hadn't called me yet is they were still waiting for some prognostics to come back. So they were waiting for and prognostics means whether it's estrogen receptor positive, progesterone or HER2. Um, so anyways, 
kind of a long story from there. We did know that it was estrogen and progesterone positive. We weren't sure about HER2. And then I had to, they had to send for further testing to see if it was HER2 positive. Um, and what ended up coming back is I was, I had um, triple positive invasive ductal carcinoma. And so with a triple positive diagnosis comes chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, and that immunotherapy is specifically targeted to the HER2 component. Um, so as you can imagine, it was definitely another gut punch, right? Something that you weren't expecting. So I had surgery July 14th, and then I ended up starting chemotherapy and immunotherapy on August 24th. So about six weeks later, I started chemo. Um, I had 12 weeks of weekly chemo with immunotherapy. And then after those 12 weeks of chemotherapy, um, I switched to just immunotherapy for every three weeks for an additional nine months. So it was a total of one year of treatment. So I did have Taxol as my chemotherapy, and then I had Herceptin as the immunotherapy. I did have some minor side effects, and this is where I felt really grateful to have the experience that I did in terms of working with patients. So as an oncology dietitian, um, one of my roles is to help patients throughout the course of treatment to help ensure that they have adequate nutrition and also to help mitigate side effects using nutrition. Um, so that is where I was really grateful that I had that expertise, that knowledge, and the tools and resources available to me. So I did have some nausea, but I did utilize um, nutrition and um, some like ginger and peppermint and all these different um, avenues to help mitigate the nausea to the point where it, it was very tolerable. Um, I had some fatigue, definitely. I mean, 99% of patients will experience fatigue during the course of cancer treatment. And um, so I definitely felt that. And it's definitely cancer-related fatigue. So cancer-related fatigue is defined as fatigue that um, is a result of either cancer itself or its treatments that is not often alleviated by rest, right? So you could sleep eight to nine hours at night and still wake up exhausted. Um, so I was feeling that fatigue, but I felt like I was still living a really high quality of life, you know, I kind of had to with, you know, the kids and everything, but I've described that having the parenting during cancer has been the hardest thing for me. Right. Bec and, and because you, you still have to parent, right? Like these kids still need you. They still have needs. They're so little, but, I, and so that was hard, but at the same time, it was so good because it forced you to do those things, right? Like I have to get my daughter to school. I have no other choice, right? So it was, so in a way it was hard, but in a way it was beneficial to like keep you going and it wouldn't allow you to sit in bed essentially. Um, the last, so I finished treatment in August and then I saw my oncologist again in October. Um, and I was actually really surprised. He moved me right from um, that October checkup to six months follow-ups right away. Um, and cause he was quite impressed in how I was doing in follow-up. And um, I did have some GI issues from treatment as well. And once treatment ended, those GI issues got so much better. So he's like, oh, all right. So, um, so I go back in April, so that'll be six months. Um, and I, my type of cancer doesn't have any scans that are scheduled. It's kind of based on symptoms, which I think is hard and good at the same time, right? Like there's so many like positive and negatives to that. So, um, I, and then I am on um, tamoxifen and my plan for that is, um, 10 years, my oncologist would like me to be on tamoxifen for. So I've been on tamoxifen for um, just over a year and, and tolerating it quite well. And the plan is to continue it for now. So if you have recently been diagnosed with cancer, my first recommendation would be to take it one step at a time. It's incredibly overwhelming. It's scary. The unknowns are just awful. Um, however, when I looked ahead and I was like, oh my gosh, I have a year of treatment that would make the whole process feel so much harder, right? But if I could just take one day at a time, I'm getting through today, I'm getting through these symptoms, I'm getting through this cycle, um, it really helped make a huge difference. Um, and the second thing, and sometimes this can, I think can, depending on where somebody is in their journey can be even might be hard to hear and so forth. But I think one thing that really was a turning point for me was when I stopped focusing on the things that cancer was taking from me, right? We could all go on and on about what cancer takes from somebody, right? The loss of their breasts, right? Um, time away from their kids, right? All, all of that. 
But when I was able to focus on things that it was showing me instead, right? And things to learn from, that's when I really have like a mental shift in my journey. And not to say that I was never angry again or frustrated because those are valid feelings. And I think that we should feel those feelings, but trying to focus on, okay, what can I learn from this experience? And for me, the learnings were mostly about how, how do I manage my stress? Like what's important in life? Like the little moments, like changing my daughter's diaper, right? Those things that you would never think of being like, I want to do that again. Like those really like what you can, what you consider really mundane tasks are some of the best things in the whole world. So, um, trying to focus on where your mindset is can be really powerful. Um, and one key thing for me was working with a, a therapist during the whole time. I still work with that therapist in survivorship here. Um, so I guess those are probably some of my biggest recommendations is take it one day at a time, 